Hi guys, welcome back. It's time for lesson 16. We're going to do delta function potential again, but this time we'll be discussing scattering states. Also, I have a another addendum to our ever-evolving interpretation and understanding of the Fourier transform. So let's get started. First of all, um, I want to point out that for the delta function potential, there was only one bound state unlike the infinite square well and simple harmonic oscillator where there were an infinite number of states. But what happens to the delta function potential when you let the energy become greater than zero? Well, let's see. If you uh, write out the Schrodinger equation and then um, move things around a little bit, you can see that uh, when focusing on positions that are not at the origin, that if the energy is positive, you end up with uh, simple traveling waves. Traveling waves meaning some component of e to the plus ikx and a little bit of e to the minus ikx. Now, that particular wave function is not very well behaved in infinity, but never mind, we'll just march ahead and uh, hope that we can work out some way to make it make sense a little bit later. Now the thing is, we know the wave function has to be defined on the left and on the right side of the delta function, but we don't really know what's going to go on at the delta function yet. But um, what we can do is simply write an arbitrary or a general expression for a linear superposition of a right traveling and left traveling wave on the left of the potential and a right traveling and left traveling wave on the right of the potential. Now. Um, Generally, in an experimental setup, we would have particles, a particle beam coming from, say, one direction, and uh, particles would either scatter off the potential or they would be transmitted through the potential, but uh, that would mean that there would be no particles coming from the right of the potential heading left. So that means the G term in this expression would be zero. So we can get rid of the G we can rewrite our wave function er everywhere but at the origin as a right and left traveling wave to the left of the potential and a, only a right traveling wave to the right of the potential. Now, we know the wave function has to be continuous, but it also, uh, it turns out, has to have a discontinuity in the first derivative, the same way it did for the bound state. And you can remember um, how that worked. You know, to be continuous, of course, a plus b has to be equal to f because uh, you plug in 0 in for x uh, for the wave function at the left and the wave function at the right, and you get a plus b is f. You can write out the Schrodinger equation, including the delta function, at the origin. If you integrate the Schrodinger equation just from just to the left, minus epsilon, to just to the right, plus epsilon, You'll notice that the first term gives you a difference between the first derivative, the second term gives you a constant, and the term on the right of the equal sign, of course, is zero because we're, we're taking an infinitesimal integral uh, of a finite wave function. So we get the simple result that uh, the difference in the derivative of psi between the just to the right and just to the left of the origin plus 2m alpha over h bar squared times the value of the wave function at the origin must be zero. If you remember all that, stick in the definition of psi just to the left and just to the right, you get the expression ikf minus ika minus b plus 2m alpha over h bar squared times f, that has to be zero. And of course, since we know, we remember that a plus b is equal to f, we can get rid of b in the top expression, and that allows us to solve for f over a, then we can put f over a back in and solve for b over a. In any case, we get two expressions, one for the ratio of b to a and one for the ratio of f to a. Um, now it turns out that the probability of being reflected is equal to the, uh, the ratio of b to a magnitude squared, and the ratio of being transmitted is the ratio of f to a magnitude squared. What I like to do actually when I'm solving these kind of problems is to just set a equal to 1 because 
all we ever get out of the analysis is the ratio of b to a or f to a and it's at that point there's only two numbers really that are of any interest and so you might as well just set a to one and just solve for b and f anyway uh, if you calculate the probability of transmission and the probability of reflection as a function of energy where you measure energy in units of alpha squared m over 2 h bar squared that's that sort of natural units of energy for the problem you can see that you get uh, what may be an obvious result when when you think about it but uh, basically the higher the energy the lower the probability of reflection and the higher the probability of transmission so this is sort of consistent with most actual real scattering experiments that if you go to a high enough energy that the thing won't get stopped it won't get reflected it'll just pass right on through okay so um, I want to point out a couple things about this result one is that we still haven't dealt with the problem of the uh, fact that these wave functions don't really behave very well notice that beta is inversely proportional to k so beta depends on energy and you can see that beta shows up in both of these ratios b to a and f to a and so those ratios also depend on energy now what if I wanted to make a wave packet how would I have to do I'd have to superpose a, a bunch of different wavelengths in order to form a wave packet that means I'd have to superpose a bunch of different momenta or different k's and each k has a different ratio of b to a or f to a so if you think about forming a wave packet you immediately think about the Fourier transform because you know that a Gaussian wave packet for example has a Gaussian Fourier transform which means that it's a, a superposition of different momenta with a sort of a Gaussian shape and that uh, if you want to figure out how that Fourier transform evolves in time each energy component evolves at a different frequency but each energy component is of course the same thing as a different momentum component since the only thing energy depends on is momentum and so uh, what you get is a wave packet that evolves uh, the way we computed in computing project eight or five excuse me computing project five where uh, you multiply each e to the i kx by e to the minus i omega sub kt and then integrate over all k to get the time evolution of the whole thing so i want to show you a, a little demo about that now okay so this is actually the solution for computing project seven which we're not going to get to for a while but I just wanted to give you a sneak peek in advance, and also it relates to the uh, concept I want to demonstrate right now. Uh, what you see there on the left is a wave packet that's propagating to the right, and it's about to encounter a potential barrier. That's the blue sort of cylindrical thing there. Okay, that's a that's a potential barrier. You can kind of see through it a little bit, but uh, the wave packet's going to hit that potential barrier, and it's going to uh, some of it is going to reflect and some of it is going to be transmitted and since we can do uh, reflection and transmission from a Dirac delta function potential as in addition to uh, a finite size barrier like this one um, a similar effect is going to occur but what I want to point out is that um, the wave packet spreads just like it does in the free particle case it is in fact a free particle wave function at this point so it's a spreading wave packet but when it gets close to the barrier you'll notice that there's some interference going on the uh, the wave packet partially reflects and is partially transmitted and above here we have the calculation of the probability of finding the particle on the left and the probability of finding the particle on the right as a function of time so you can see that uh, after the encounter the probability of being on the left is diminished the probability of being on the right is enhanced because obviously there's a finite probability of finding the particle over here um, now classically this barrier is higher than the kinetic energy components any of the kinetic energy components of the wave packet and so classically there should be no transmission at all so this phenomena is sometimes called barrier penetration but what I what I wanted to get to as far as this demo is concerned is simply that you can form a wave packet of many different momentum components and 
compute what happens as a function of time. We'll learn how to do this for a, for a potential barrier in, uh, in computing project 7, but uh, you can do it in a direct way that for an arbitrary potential, um, and you see that you get some chance of being transmitted, some chance of being uh, reflected, but that in, the, in sort of a realistic scenario, you'd have a superposition of many different momentum components in order to form a wave packet. That's the idea. Okay, so what that means is, what the ratio B to A really is, is it's the ratio of the, uh, it's the thing you multiply the Fourier transform of the initial wave packet by to get the Fourier transform of the reflected wave. And F over A is the thing you multiply the Fourier transform of the incoming wave by to get the Fourier transform of the, re the uh, transmitted wave. So, and when I say multiply Fourier transform by, I mean that each K component of the Fourier transform gets multiplied by the ratio B to A for that K. And, it, and the next K component gets multiplied by a different ratio B to A, but the one that's appropriate for the next K, and the next K, and the next K. So you're actually multiplying by this ratio B to A and F to A in momentum space. So there, it's actually a kind of a vector that you multiply each component, that you multiply the Fourier transform by, where each momentum component gets multiplied by a slightly different number since B over A and F over A depend on momentum. Anyway, I hope that's clear. Here's another demo to helpfully, uh, hopefully help you visualize what I mean by all that. So here we have a slightly different approach. Um, let me describe for you what we have here. This is the initial wave packet moving in from the left and uh, basically it's uh, e to the i k zero x times a Gaussian. And so you get a Gaussian envelope around a traveling wave. If you take the Fourier transform of this guy um, and you multiply that Fourier transform by the ratio of B to A. In other words, where if you multiply the uh, initial Fourier transform with the ratio of B to A, what you get is a new packet, but that packet happens to be over here at t equals zero, which is an interesting thing, because the B coefficient only applies to the wave function when it's to the left of the potential. So basically the, the, the reflected packet is over here at t equals zero. Uh, it hasn't, in a way, you could think of it that way, it, it, but it's not realized yet because it's on the right-hand side of the origin, uh, which is only valid for the uh, F, or the transmitted part of the, the packet. On the other hand, if you take the original um, Fourier transform of the original packet and multiply by the ratio of F over A, then you get this uh, packet. But of course, this packet is the transmitted packet, but it it's only really valid on the right-hand side of the potential. Now, what's the total wave function? Well, on the left-hand side of the potential, it's the sum of this packet and this packet. And on the right-hand side of the potential, it's just this packet. But of course, this packet's on the left, this packet's on the right, so they don't actually contribute at this moment to the real wave packet. At this moment, the only contribution to the real wave packet is the incoming wave. But what happens if we turn on the time? Now, these packets evolve in time exactly the same way the packets, the packet you're using for Computing Project 5, the, the free particle wave packet. And uh, if you turn on the time, you'll notice something interesting happens. These guys come together. Now, this packet and this packet and this packet just continue to evolve as free particle wave packets. But on the left-hand side of the potential of the origin, the result is the sum of this one and this one. On the right-hand side, it's just this one. So the potential is right in here. So notice that already we're getting some interference between this left-moving packet and this right-moving packet. Let me go ahead and turn on the time again. You can see that you get a kind of a standing wave behavior. And then after the packets pass through, the transmitted packet is now all that contributes to this packet, and the reflected packet is all that contributes to that packet. So uh, the Fourier transform 
of the original incoming packet now produces a wave that's over here on the right hand side if you evolve it on its own and uh, it doesn't contribute to anything because it's only a valid contributor on the left side so anyway that's one simple way to do uh, scattering calculations using the Fourier transform um, for free particle states okay now one other thing I want to do in these slides for today is to continually evolve and deepen our understanding of the discrete of the Fourier transform in general and today in particular the discrete Fourier transform so here are the expressions for the discrete Fourier transform and the discrete inverse Fourier transform uh, the idea is the Fourier transform is now a uh, sequence of numbers the function whose Fourier transform you're computing the discrete version is not really a continuous function but rather it's a sampled function so you have a bunch of samples of a function and you're computing the Fourier transform of those samples and what you get is a sampled Fourier transform so the function is a list of numbers the Fourier transform is a corresponding list of numbers and uh, you can jump back and forth between the function and the Fourier transform and the Fourier transform and the function so all the information in the function winds up also in its Fourier transform and vice versa um, unfortunately looking at those summation symbols and trying to cogitate upon those calculations uh, doesn't really lend a lot of insight into what's actually going on but uh, I hope that when you're done with these slides you'll have more insight than you have now about what's going on because in fact the discrete Fourier transform is just another form of a change of basis so we're just changing from one basis to another and we can change back and forth the values of the Fourier transform give us different information than the values of the function but they're equally uh, useful I guess and uh, and they both contain all the information about the function each contains all the information that the other contains I want you to notice one big difference between the discrete Fourier transform and the and the uh, continuous Fourier transform and that is that the discrete version isn't symmetric so in the continuous version there's a 1 over the square root of 2 pi in front of each of them and the integrals look almost exactly the same in the discrete version the convention is that the uh, the function which is the superposition of all the Fourier transform terms has a 1 over n in front of the summation sign and the uh, the Fourier transform does not have any 1 over n now uh, in the continuous version they basically take the 1 over 2 pi and split it between the two each of them gets a 1 over square root of 2 pi we could do the same thing here and put a 1 over the square root of big N in front of each of those summation signs but that's just not the way it's done it's just a tradition to do it this way all the computer software you ever use that computes the discrete Fourier transform is going to do it this way because that's the way everybody does it so I just wanted to point out that distinction so that you're not too disturbed by it what I want to do is to develop a, a Dirac notation or a matrix vector representation of the Fourier transform what I want you to focus on is the thing in the parentheses there the e to the minus 2 pi i k over n now the sum in this summation is over j so the thing in parentheses is is getting multiplied or is getting taken to a higher and higher power and multiplied by the original function to produce the kth component of the discrete Fourier transform and notice that uh, the 2 pi over n is pretty prominent there what it means is if you have an n element function you take 2 pi and divide it into n slices so um, I'm gonna do an example in a moment with four pieces where the Fourier transform is four element vector the original function is a four element vector and so we would be dividing 2 pi by 4 which would give us pi over 2 or 90 degrees so um, I'm going to define alpha to be e to the minus 2 pi i over n and uh, in the case n equals 4 of course that means alpha is going to be e to the minus i times pi over 2 or e to the minus i times 90 degrees and uh, 
you can think of alpha as just the angle. It's the angle you get when you divide 2 pi by n. So if n is 4, obviously that's a 90 degree angle. And then you can think of the Fourier transform as just the jth element of the function times alpha to the k to the jth power. So the kth element of the Fourier transform gets alpha to the k multiplied by, or taken to the power of j, and then multiplied out. If you think of the original function as a vector, so in this case it's a four element column vector, you can think of k, the kth basis vector of the Fourier transform basis as being alpha to the 0k, alpha to the 1k, alpha to the 2k, and alpha to the 3k, all divided by 4. So that would be like, so for example, um, if you wanted to calculate the dot product of the kth bra vector, now the, the bra is just the horizontal version of the ket without the 1 over n. Remember the 1 over n only shows up in the inverse Fourier transform, the 1 over n doesn't show in the other, and the consequence of that is that when you make the bra of a basis vector, you don't, you don't just uh, take the complex conjugate of each of these guys, you, um, you take the complex conjugate of the alphas, but you don't carry over the n. So anyway, this means that the inner product of k and f, where f is some arbitrary function, is just uh, like so, f0, alpha to the 0k, time plus f1, alpha to the minus 1k, and so on. Note that this is exactly the same as the Fourier transform. It's just written slightly differently. And uh, that means you can think of the ket k and the bra k as basis vectors. And the kth element of the Fourier transform is simply the projection of f onto the k direction. So we're basically saying how much does f point in the k direction? You can think of k as just a unit vector in some other space. Let's go ahead and push on this four element system and see if we can find an easier way to visualize what's actually going on. That's what I want to get to. So our four element basis vectors are um, the zero vector. That means we're we're taking uh, alpha to the 0 to different powers, but of course alpha to the 0 is just 1, and uh, that means that we just have a list of 1s. And then the 1 vector has alpha to the 0, alpha to the 1, alpha to the 2, and alpha to the 3. The 2 vector, instead of going up by 1 each time, it goes up by 2, and the 3 vector, instead of going up by 2, it goes up by 3. And they all have a 1 fourth. The corresponding bras are easy to work out. The only difference is the alphas are taken to the negative power rather than the positive power. And then you can work out the inner product of any bra, the arbitrary kth bra and the jth ket. Uh, you can see that that's easy to do. You just put in the general expressions for um, those basis vectors in terms of alpha. And, uh, and you get the following result. Now notice that there is a k minus j in each term. What I'm going to point out is that when k and j are equal, each of those alphas gets taken to the 0 power, and that makes them all 1. And so you get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 divided by 4, and you get an inner product of 1. So the whole thing works out to be normalized correctly. However, if j is different than k, j and k are integers, if j and k are, are different, then you're going to get alpha to some power. You're going to get 1 plus alpha to some power plus alpha to twice that much plus alpha times 3 times that much. But the angles here are all 90, 180, 270, and 360 degrees. So in fact, we never get to 360 degrees because there are only four elements. So it's 0, 90, 180, 270. And so if you take a integer power, higher integer powers of phasors that have those different angles, when you add them up, you're always going to get zero, no matter whether you do 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that works out here in a moment. Let's, uh, let's try to make a more visual representation of this thing using phasors. So what I want to do is to replace these numbers that show up here as powers of alpha and so on 
with phasers that show us what the angles are. So one, of course, is a phaser that points along the real axis, so it's horizontal. Alpha to the 1. Now remember, alpha is minus pi over 2 when n equals 4. So alpha to the 1 is going to be a down-pointing phaser. Alpha squared is going to point to the left, and alpha cubed is going to point straight up. We just add 90 degrees each time. On the other hand, if you go up by two powers each time, alpha squared is going to be nine, or 180 degrees, so it's going to point to the left. Alpha to the fourth, we're back to 360 degrees, and alpha to the sixth, we're, we're uh, another 180 degrees, so it points back to the left. So the n equals 2 ket has phasers that point back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The n equals 3 ket, you go 270 degrees, so you start pointing to the right, then you go 270, that gets you all the way around to point up. Then another 270 gets you pointing left, and another 270 gets you pointing down. I want you to notice that that's exactly the same y thing you'd get if you'd chosen minus 90, or to go counterclockwise 90 degrees each time. You get the same result. So there's a sense in which the third ket is like the n equals minus 1 ket. It's like the minus... In fact, it's exactly the negative of the of the one ket each time. So that's uh, that's kind of interesting. In other words, well, I don't mean each element is the negative of the corresponding one ket, but I mean that it's like turning the phaser at a negative one angle, a negative ninety degrees each time around, instead of a positive ninety degrees each time around. Okay. So we could also do this for the bras, except, of course, the bras have to rotate in the opposite direction because the alphas have a minus 1 power, minus 2, minus 3, and so on. So the bras go in the opposite direction. And uh, it's interesting to see how that works out. If I take the ket 1 and hit it on the bra, or hit the bra 1 on the ket 1, I, get, uh, I have to multiply corresponding elements and then and then that get the sum. But I want you to notice what you get when you multiply the corresponding elements. You get 1 times 1. Then you get e to the plus pi over 2 times e to the minus pi over 2. But of course that's just 1. And then you get e to the uh, e to the i pi. And then you get e to the minus i pi. But of course that's also 1. And then you get e to the i... Uh, what is it? e to the minus pi over 2 i pi over 2 times e to the plus i pi over 2, and that's also 1. So when you multiply that all out, you get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, all divided by 4, and the whole thing turns out to be 1. So if we're looking at the bra 1 and the ket 2 uh, inner product, you'll notice that, again, we're going to multiply corresponding pieces of the bra and the ket. And when you calculate the product of those things, you notice what you get is a phasor that rotates by 90 degrees uh, for each component. So the 1 times 1 is a phaser pointing to the right. Uh, 180 times, one ni or times 90 is a phaser pointing down. 180 times 1 is a phaser pointing to the left. And 270 times 180 is a phaser pointing straight up. Um, the sum of all those four phasers <coughs> has got to be 0. So you get an orthogonal 1 and 2. And it turns out if if either of the numbers is different from the the other, then uh, then you get nothing. So that's the way it works. And the arrow business is just a way to visualize what's happening with the phases, because it's the phases that actually are the main point here. So let's do the same thing, but this time for n equals 8. There's the 0, 1, 2, and 3 kets, and the 4, 5, 6, and 7 kets. Um, I want to point out something about the 4 ket. Notice that every other component is advanced by 180 degrees. That was also true in the n equals 4 case. The n equal 2 ket there um, had that property. It's always the capital N over 2 ket that has the property that the next phaser is 180 degrees out of phase with the previous one. And uh, that makes sense because it's, it's uh, 2 pi over n is the phase alpha, and if we go capital N over 2, then uh, we end up with pi as the, as the phase from one component to the next, and that's exactly what you see there in the fourth ket. So 
what I want to point out is that um, all the kets up to n over 2 have ever increasing values of alpha but the kets after n over 2 they also have increasing values of alpha but I want you to think of them in a different way because you can also think of the n equals 7 ket in this example as having a frequency of minus 1. If you look at the 1 ket and the 7 ket you'll notice that the phasers in the 7 ket advance the same magnitude of phase each time but in the opposite direction. So it looks like a negative 45 degrees each time instead of plus 45 degrees in the n equals 1. And, and the 6 ket is advancing minus 90 degrees each time whereas the 2 is plus 90 and the 8 ket is minus 135 degrees each time whereas the 3 ket is plus 135 degrees each time. So there's a very real sense in which you can think of 7 is minus 1, 6 is minus 2, and 5 as minus 3. So in reality in the discrete Fourier transform the negative frequencies are actually built in but they show up in the kets that go from n over 2 plus 1 up to n minus 1 and uh, and the minus and, and they go how can I say this the most negative frequency is the n over 2 plus 1 in this case it's the 5 and the least negative frequency is the n minus 1 in this case that's the 7 so that's where the negative frequencies are and in the computing project 5 you'll notice there's a lot of monkey business trying to work out where those negative frequencies are but I thought with this picture of what's going on it might be easier to understand so what does it mean it means that this complicated formula is really just the inner product of the kth basis vector and the function it's just a simple inner product and that the uh, the function when you reconstruct the function that complicated function is just the sum over the Fourier components times the Fourier basis vector so it's just a simple component basis vector sum and you can think of that if you put those two pieces together you can see that we have back our simple quantum mechanical actually it's linear algebra formula of, of the change of basis that uh, the sum of k over the bras and the kets the projection operators for the k basis is the identity and so you can simply say f equals identity times f but in quantum mechanics we can also put in the time and so the time evolution of that ket is what you get by simply sticking in e to the minus i omega t for each of the components of the Fourier transform and that's what computing project 5 is all about calculating that sum and notice that uh, really that's just the inverse Fourier transform so all you have to do is stick the e to the minus i omega t in and multiply all the Fourier components by their corresponding frequency phasers and then perform the inverse Fourier transform and that's exactly what we do in project 5 so that's all we have for today